Hi, welcome back. In this session, I want to talk about the challenges in valuing mature firms. First, let's look at the characteristics that make a mature firm mature. The first is when you look at growth rates, especially in revenues, that those growth rates are approaching the growth rate of the economy, at least in nominal terms. So the economy is growing at three, four, five percent. Mature firms are not growing at 20 percent. They're more likely to be growing at eight or nine or seven or even closer to three percent. The second is mature firms, margins have steadied. What does that mean? You're not going to see margins jump around or increase. There's no trend lines in margins. There's one exception to the rule. If you're a mature commodity company, your margins will still shift year to year, depending on where you are in the commodity price cycle. But at least across the cycle, I have a pretty good sense of what your margins are going to be. The third is, if you have comparative advantages, I can see them now. Note that not all mature firms have comparative advantages, but those that do, you know what those competitive advantages are, whether it's brand name or lower cost production. For mature firms, because their earnings are now positive and stable, at least over a cycle, and your revenue growth rate is low, the capacity to borrow money has now opened up. Whether they actually use it or not varies across firms, but they have the capacity to borrow money. And in a related aspect, because they're now mature, they're not growing very fast, they don't have to reinvest as much, they're throwing off cash flows. Now they can choose to return those cash flows as dividends or buybacks. They can choose not to, in which case they can become a cash balance. And finally, this is not true for all mature firms, mature firms as their growth starts to come down, start looking outward for growth. What does that mean? Because they don't have enough projects to generate the growth they want to do, they try to do acquisitions. And acquisitions are tricky from a valuation perspective, as we'll see. So when you look at mature firms, let's look at some of the valuation challenges. Remember we talked about the value of a firm coming from assets in place and growth assets. The first thing to recognize at mature firms is more of your value will come from assets in place than it did for high growth firms and definitely more than for startups where there is no assets in place. When you look at assets in place, what do you look at? You look at the current financial statements. And mature firms have a long history, so you have that advantage. But a couple of things to watch out for. The first is mature firms start to play earnings games. What does that mean? I'm not talking about committing accounting fraud, but accounting offers discretion. And those companies that choose to be aggressive can use their discretion to report higher earnings. And those companies that are conservative report lower earnings. Your job and my job in valuing these firms is to look past that gaming. The second is mature firms get set in their ways. Are those good ways? Not necessarily. In fact, you could argue that because mature firms have been successful and they've got to where they are, they can sometimes get into bad habits and the earnings you're looking at reflect the existing management in place with all those inefficiencies built in. Now, is there a possibility that management can change? Yes. And if that happens, could the assets in place be worth a lot more? Could be. So in fact, with mature firms, you open this door of there's a value for the firm with the existing management, but there could be a different value with somebody else running the firm. On growth assets, it isn't as big a percentage of the value for mature firms as it is for, for growth firms, but there are some growth assets. But those growth assets are less likely to be internal from projects and more likely to come from outside. We talked about acquisitions. So for to grow, mature firms often have to take big investments. So if you're a $100 billion firm, to grow you, an individual project might not make a difference, but an acquisition could. So you're going to see more turning towards acquisitions at this stage and your job then is to gauge whether there's value added or destroyed from that acquisition. You might also have to deal with something we've already had to deal with with growth firms as well, which is there can be long lead times between investment and payoff. And if that, there is that lead time that can affect what kind of growth you see in a firm. In other words, this firm might not be reinvesting much, but if you wait, there will be growth because the reinvestment from the past will start to show up as growth. So you have challenges, lesser so than with younger firms, but mature firms still have their challenges. On the risk dimension, things should be easy, right? Many mature firms are publicly traded. You often have a long period of stock prices you can look at, make a judgment on risk based on price-based risk measures. 
or you pre if you prefer looking at intrinsic numbers you can look at earnings over time or revenues over time and mature firms are more likely to have settled risk profiles what does that mean remember with the, with high growth firms we talked about changing the cost of capital over time mature firms you should need to do that less because you're already pretty close to where you will be as as you will be in steady state there's one, there are a couple of estimation issues though that you still have to deal with with mature firms. The first is some mature firms borrow money, they have multiple types of debt out there in different currencies, you know, short term, long term, fixed rate, floating rate. It's easy to get distracted and use the wrong cost of debt because you focused on a piece of the debt. That's one. The second is for mature firms, the cost of capital can and will change if the mix of debt and equity changes. And third, if you're a mature firm going out and doing acquisitions, you can change your risk profile because you're entering new businesses. Those new businesses can be riskier or safer than your existing businesses. So when you value a mature firm, you feel comfortable. You have a lot of history, but check to see if you can just use that historical data because the company itself might choose to change its profile. So when you look at the valuation challenges you face in, in terms of getting a terminal value, with a mature firm, you're closer to closure, that terminal value, than you are with a high growth firm. And it might seem relatively simple. You, know, you just move the growth rates down towards the growth rate of the economy and you're done. But remember that when you put your company into closure, it's not just that the growth rate has to be less than the growth rate of the economy. It's that the rest of the company should be consistent with your assumption about it being a mature company. What does it mean? If your company is growing at 2% a year forever and an economy growing at 4%, that is low enough to justify using terminal value, stable growth. But not if the company is reinvesting as if it's a high growth firm or as a cost of capital reflecting things changing. So it's not just the growth rate, the rest of the characteristics. The second is, if you lock your company into what it's doing right now in perpetuity, which is what you do in a terminal value, say your company is taking projects that earn 5% returns on capital and the cost of capital is 8%. That's what they've done for the last decade and you lock it in. You're in effect locking in bad management in perpetuity. In some cases, that might be merited. If you're valuing a company with terrible corporate governance, a family controlled company that's badly run, you might say there's nothing that's going to change. But to the extent that there can be management change, you might underestimate the value of the company by locking in that bad practice. So what should you do? Familiar ground. Go through the five-step process. Start by telling a story, but here the story is going to be bounded. What does that mean? When you tell a story for a startup or even a high growth company, you can tell stories about how the company will evolve and change because you're early in the story for that company. You can map out pathways based on what you see in the company. If you, if you watch my session on Tesla, the pathways for Tesla are manifold and I can plausibly tell, take any of those pathways. In contrast, if I'm valuing Coca-Cola or Kraft Heinz, I'm much more bounded because I'm going to look at the past financials and if I'm going to deviate from it, I've got to give you a very strong story. So when I look at the past financials, I'm going to look at your revenue growth, your margins over time, how you've reinvested, how variable your earnings are. And that's going to play a big role in the story I craft for you. So the story here is much more constrained by your own numbers. And I will use external information by looking at the sector averages, the investor base you've accumulated. But here the story is much more likely to be bounded by what I can see out there. Once I've told a story for a mature company, it should be a much easier 3 P test. Is it possible, plausible, probable? Before, so when I extrapolate historical data for a mature company, I might say, look, you know, I'm just extrapolating past growth and past margins. And most of the time, I should be able to justify it. It's possible, it's plausible, it's probable, with two caveats. The first is if there are macroeconomic and regulatory changes that truly change the landscape of the business this company is in, that's got to be factored in. When you valued AT&T in 1980, when it was a monopoly, the value you'd get was very different than when you value it 10 years later when the monopoly had been broken down. 
You also have to be careful if your business is being disrupted, a new way of doing business is entered in. Extrapolating the past for your company might lead you to very misleading judgment on your company. And if you're deviating from the historical path, then you need a story of why. So if you're taking a company that historically has had low margins, it's a mature company, and you give it much higher margins in the future, the onus is on you to explain why you think margins will shift up. So when you look at the 3P test, if you're just extrapolating the past, check for macroeconomic and regulatory changes and disruption. If you're breaking from the past, think about the story you tell and whether you can justify that break from the past. Now you get from story to inputs, you're going to go through the familiar inputs. It's a mature company, the inputs are the same for a high, as for a high growth company, but the numbers are more bounded. When you do the revenue growth rate, that growth rate might just be an extrapolation of past growth or it might be a deviation. Either way, your story has to explain that growth rate. But if you're taking a company that's been growing at 5% and you're giving it a 20% growth rate, you better come up with a really strong, strong story of what's changed. In terms of margins, again, the easiest pathway is to extrapolate the past, but it might not be the right pathway for your company. Maybe your company's business has changed, and, you know, the, but the potential for margins to improve dramatically to mature company are smaller. Because remember that economies of scale argument used for high growth companies doesn't work for mature companies. You already scaled up. So whatever story you tell has to explain to me why margins are changing from the past. But the break is probably not going to be as significant as it was for high growth companies. In terms of reinvestment, again, you have a lot of history and you can stay close to the history, easy to defend. But here again, changes in the way companies invest in a business, changes in business models can translate into, into a different reinvestment. And finally, on risk, as I said, mature companies are one of, um, among the few companies. We can estimate a cost of capital for the company today and leave it unchanged over time and get away with it. But here again, you might want to kick the tires. The debt ratio likely to change, the business mix changing, because those could affect your cost of capital. So you've told a story, you've checked to make sure it's possible and plausible, converted the story to numbers, and you can see with mature companies why people feel more comfortable, because so much of what they do is drawn from history. You value the business. Remember we talked about how much of the value comes from the terminal value, less of the value for a mature company will come from the terminal value. It's neither good nor bad, it is what it is. And the divergence of opinion about what that value is will be smaller. With Tesla, when we value high growth companies, you can get big disagreements about value and no way to break the differences because different stories lead to different value. Well, could you have different values for Coca-Cola? Yes, but those differences are going to be smaller. The divergence in value is also going to be smaller. But if you get divergences, they're going to come not from differences of opinion about the operations of the company, but in the way the company is financed and how much cash it returns to shareholders. Let me explain. Let's say you're valuing a company which has very little debt. It's a mature company. It has very little debt because the management historically has chosen not to borrow money. You value the company. I look at the same company and in my story, the management has shifted. They're going to take on debt. I could get a different financing mix, a different cost of capital, a different value for the business. You value mature company, historically it has you know, held on to cash and not returned the cash. You're going to come up with a value for the business. I take that same company and value it on the assumption that that cash, rather than being held at the company, is going to be used on dividends and buybacks. I could come up with a different value for the business. Put simply, when you get differences in value for mature companies, those differences come from divergences in, in the story on the financing and the cash return part of the story rather than in the operating part. And finally, as with any valuation, you keep the feedback loop open. You value mature company, the value is different from the price. Let's say it's much, you know, much higher than the price. You said stock looks undervalued. Before you jump in, you might want to test out the waters. Maybe the price is lower because the market sees disruption that you haven't brought into value. So if you find your mature company undervalued, you want to make sure you're not buying a value trap. A value trap is a company that looks cheap relative to its history, but it's cheap for a good reason. 
And when you value a company by extrapolating the past, you're in effect assuming the existing management stays in place. But what if that management is not efficient? The, the, an activist investor showing up could very dramatically change the value of the company. So you might want to scan the horizon and ask, hey, this company has been around a long time. It's been run the same way, but is there a chance that this company could be run differently? And what would the value be if that were the case? So let's take an example. The company I'm going to value is Unilever, a consumer product company of long standing. It's been around more than a century. And here in this graph, I've looked at the last you know, last 20 years plus for Unilever. And already you can see, if you look at the last decade, that this company is a slow growth company. Its revenue growth is one, no, it's, ba it's basically, its revenues are stagnant. Its margins have improved over the last decade from about 16% to around 18% in 2021. But this, no, it's not the kind of improvement that you would boast about in a high growth company. For a mature company, that's a pretty significant improvement. It's a slow growth, profitable company. And it's in three different businesses with different characteristics. They're all low growth, but they're very different margins. The beauty and personal care business has the highest margins. The home care business has the lowest margins. I'm getting a sense of the company. It's a low growth company in three businesses. None of the businesses is going to deliver growth. In fact, the food and refreshment business which is, close, which is one of the larger businesses, has negative growth rate. As I, sit, as I get ready to frame my story, I'm recognizing that this is a company which, is, which has had trouble delivering revenue growth. It's been profitable, but its margins are pretty stagnant. Now they're around 18%. So the story I tell is going to reflect what I've learned from the history. I'm going to keep, re keep revenue growth low. I'm going to assume a 2% growth rate, and even that I'm assume, I, I think is going to be pretty optimistic. I do believe that the improvement in margins they've seen in the last decade, primarily by cutting products that were not profitable, is going to stick. But additional improvement is going to be difficult. So I'm going to assume the margins are going to stabilize around 18%. Because the growth is so low, there's not much need for reinvestment. So that kind of takes care of itself. It's not an assumption I'm going to spend much time on. And I do, I will assume in this case, the cost of capital, which is based on a mix of 22% debt and 78% equity, is going to stay at, at about where it is today, about 9%. I don't see any failure risk in this company. It's a very boring story, but boring fits. And my Unilever value of 24.2 euros reflects that story. Low growth, margins around where they are, cost of capital stays at where it is. This is a status quo story. If nothing changes, this is a low growth, stable margin company with a steady state cost of capital. It looks significantly overvalued at 45.6 euros per share. That's with existing management running it. And I don't particularly like the existing management but we'll come back and talk about challenges to it. So that's intrinsic valuation of a mature company. You say, what about pricing a mature company? A couple of challenges. The first is you have a luxury of riches. What does that mean? Remember we talked about how you can scale price to earnings, book value, invested capital, EBITDA. With mature companies, you have all those choices available to you. You think that's good? It is good, but it could potentially open the door to some serious bias, and we'll talk about why. The second is when you create peer groups, these mature companies, especially in today's world, you're often going to get multinationals that operate in many geographies and are incorporated in other countries, and you've got to control for those differences. In fact, controlling for differences, you also have to control for the fact that some of these mature companies in your peer group have very strong competitive advantages, strong brand names, and others don't. So as you look at, at, at pricing mature companies, you have to fight bias. And here's why. If you are biased in the sense that you want to find your company to be cheap, and I let you try six different multiples, you're going to find a multiple that delivers the answer you want. You keep trying. Price earnings, expensive. Price to book, expensive. EV to EBITDA, cheap. I'll use that multiple. My advice to you is, Pick your pricing multiple before you know what the results that you're going to get are because otherwise your bias is going to play out. If you have a peer group that's global, companies that are in different countries, first control for accounting differences. 
across those countries. And second, to the extent that these companies get their revenues from different parts of the world, you want to control for differences in country risk. And if some of your companies are growing, you know, and they have comparative, you know, advantages, you've got to find some way, it's not easy to do, some way of controlling for those differences in, compar in, in comparative advantages. Because companies with stronger competitive advantages should trade at higher multiples than companies without. So let's try this pricing challenge with Unilever. I put in a pure group of other consumer product companies and I'll give you the bad news. I'll give you the good news first. If I'm looking at Unilever on a pricing basis, it looks cheap on every conceivable multiple. Lower PE, lower price to book, low, you pick the multiple, it's cheap on everyone, right? That settles it, right? Let's go buy Unilever. But there's a catch. It has a, a lower growth rate than, than the companies in its peer group. In other words, it's, it's trading at a lower pricing multiple, but it also has lower growth. You see, what do I do about this? And the problem with storytelling is you can, tell your, you can talk yourself into a corner. So I opened up my statistics textbook to see if it would help me. Remember, the, you know, I've, I've given you the growth rates, the margins, the returns on capital. And my biggest concern is difference in growth, that Unilever is a low growth company in a pure group of their other companies with higher growth. What I'm trying to explain is, let's say, P-E ratios. Remember a regression in a simple or multiple regression, you got a dependent variable, in this case, P-E ratios. Here, I'm just going to focus on growth rate. I ran a regression of price earnings ratios in this sector against growth rates. So what do I do with that regression? See the 152.65, the coefficient? Every 1% increase in growth rates in a consumer product company increases my price earnings ratio by 1.5. Now, before you get too excited, the R squared is only 38%, which means that I'll get a range on my estimate. It's, it is statistically significant. The regression works, but it yields a noisy estimate. If I plug in Unilever's growth rate into that regression, I get a predicted PE of 26.98. At 19.1 times earnings, Unilever looks underpriced. If I'm in the pricing game, I'm going to argue Unilever is underpriced, not just because it trades at a lower multiple than the peer group, but even after controlling for difference in growth, growth, it trades at a lower multiple. Now, when you value mature companies, especially after the last decade, you're looking over your shoulder saying, this company looks great, but is there something that might make it a disruption target? I don't have a magic. Uh, I, 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 I don't have a magic forecasting tool, but I'll give you some of the things that you worry about when you look at your company becoming a disruption target. First, how big is the economic footprint of the market the company is in? Disruptors go after big markets. They're not interested in niche markets. Are you a big market? Big markets are more likely to be targeted for disruption. Second, how inefficient is this business? Inefficient production, inefficient delivery. One sign of inefficient businesses is nobody's happy. Producers are not happy because they're not making money. Consumers are not happy because they're paying too much. If nobody's happy in a business and it's a big business, hey, you got to worry. And third, if the way this business has been protected is with regulatory barriers, competitive barriers, keeping newcomers out, then you worry more because those barriers might work. But what if you have a disruptor who finds a way around? The taxi cab business was a big business, inefficiently run, protected by taxi cab and limousine commission saying you can do this, you cannot do this. And the ride sharing companies took advantage of it. You look at every big disrupted business, you see two or maybe all three of these characteristics of so your company is in a business which is potentially at the target of a disruption, you have to respond. And what does that mean? You take your company and you ask the question, what will happen to the value of my company if there is disruption? Let's play it through. Will your existing assets be affected? Yes, they'll become less profitable. If you're disrupted, my guess is your value of growth will go from maybe from positive to zero or negative. Your risk can change because disruptors can take a safe business and make it risky. And you might never make it to become a mature firm if you're disrupted strongly enough. 
fact, this is at the heart of what I think of as the value of, uh, of change is you can get disruption change in the value of your company. Speaking of change, the second thing to think about in the context of mature companies. Remember I said when you value a mature company, you are building in the presumption that the existing management will continue to run the company. It's in your margins, your growth rate, your reinvestment, your cost of capital. One question worth asking is, what would happen to my company if it were run differently, perhaps better? Perhaps optimally. I know optimal is a scary word because you're saying, how do I know what's optimal? Let's say you could figure out what's optimal. You could value a company twice, right? You can value a company with the status quo, existing management in place, and you can revalue the company run differently with different investing, financing, and dividend policy. And to the extent that the company can be run more efficiently, the value of the firm run differently will be greater than the status quo value. That difference is the value of control. But to do this, you've got to be able to change management. In a publicly traded company, whether you can change management will come down to a bunch of characteristics. The first is, are there restrictions on takeovers? What about voting rights? If you have voting shares and non-voting shares, it's going to be much more difficult to change the management of the company. How easy is it for an acquirer to raise capital? If you are in a market where it's easier to raise capital, the chance of change becomes higher. It also depends on the size of the company. If you're a trillion dollar company and badly run, it's going to be much more difficult to change you than if you're a 10 million or a $1 billion company. So you look at the probability that management can change and the change in value from a different management, the product of those two is called the expected value of control. It's at play every time you see a company that is a mature company that's badly run. If your question is, how do I change value? At the core, it depends on what you think you can change. If you believe the existing assets are poorly managed, your way of increasing values, you go in and run them more efficiently, cut costs, more efficient, shows up at higher margins and higher value. If you think a management is being too conservative, they are underinvesting. the way you increase values, you go into the company, assuming you can change the company, and you reinvest more. In some cases, you might think you're in a bad business. You shouldn't be reinvesting as much as you are. You'd go in and cut back on reinvestment and increase value. You might feel that your company has significant strategic or competitive advantages that your management is not exploiting. A brand name that can be built up, you'd go in and build up that brand name and, and use it to increase your value. Maybe your management doesn't like to borrow money, but it should be. You could go in and change the debt, increase the debt ratio. Or the other extreme, maybe the management is overusing debt. It's pushing the company towards default. By going in and reducing debt, you can increase value. Maybe your, com your company is a company that should be returning cash, but it's holding on to cash and investors are punishing it. They're worried about the cash. All you have to do is go into that company and return the cash and that discount will disappear. And maybe your company has been run by management that keeps going into businesses it does not understand. The classic conglomerate spread. And you think by focusing, you can increase value. You go in, you get rid of those unrelated parts, you increase value. I'm not saying any of these things are easy to do, but you can see the pathway to increasing value will depend on the company being targeted. So let's go back to Unilever. Now, I gave you the status quo story, low growth company with decent margins, 18% margins. Boring story. Cost of capital based on a 22% debt, 78% equity ratio. And to lay the groundwork for thinking about the value control at Unilever, I, I, you know, at least when I looked at Unilever in 2022, the company was, the shareholders were not happy. They had not been, not, they, hadn't, they weren't happy with the incumbent management. They weren't happy with some of the acquisitions the company had done. And in fact, one of the signs that shareholders were not happy was the presence of an activist investor, Nelson Pels, who bought a 1.5% stake. 1.5 is a small percentage, but the presence of an activist investor tells you that the battle has been joined. Because Pels believed that Unilever had too many brands and it need to prune the brands, spread out, it was spread out across too many. He wanted focus at the company. Now, will he succeed in his argument? I don't know, but the, the battle has been joined and that is the bigger part of success is now the management has to explain why they do what they do.
So I decided to try my own what if at Unilever. I'm not going to get carried away. I don't, see, I, I don't see a way in which Unilever is going to become a high growth company. But I do believe that by shifting its attention to Asia, especially India and China, it could get slightly higher growth. Slightly higher growth. 3% for the next five years instead of 2%. Why am I being so limited in my growth? You're already a big company. There's not a, you're not going to go from 2 to 10, 2 to 3%. Not a big jump, but a small jump. I do believe that if they can keep pruning the product base, remove those brands that Nelson Peltz believes are not adding value, the margins can continue to improve from 18 to 20%. And I do think that this acquisition pathway is not getting them much. They're paying too much to get the growth they are. So removing acquisitions, I think, can make them more efficient in their investing and the way this shows up with a slightly higher sales to capital ratio. Unilever is a cash-rich company, and I do believe they can carry more debt. Changing the debt ratio will lower their cost of capital from 8.97% down to 8%. So slightly higher growth, slightly higher margins, little more efficiency in their reinvestment, and a lower cost of capital. All nudges to the numbers. Here's what I get as a value with those changes put in. So slightly higher growth, slightly higher margins, more efficient reinvestment, lower cost of capital. The value that I get per share is 36.72 euros. I'm starting to approach the stock price when I restructure the firm. What does that tell me? It tells me that I think that the market is, is, is incorporating the belief that there will be change at Unilever. And I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption because when you have an activist investor in the midst and institutional investors are not happy with the way the companies run, it's ripe for change. So as you look across mature companies, you might fall back on the comfort of a lot of history. And that will make your valuation a little easier to do the story easy because in a sense, you're extending a past story. But with mature companies, you always have to look over your shoulder as to, and ask the question, is there something that could cause that story to change? Can a different management make, you know, create a different value? I hope you found this session useful and thank you very much for listening.